with these fish on, opening up the, the sea loam in order for you to get assessment how well your fish are doing on your farm. So there's a couple different techniques for, for, for doing this. One um, that was talked about this morning was associated with um, starting at the vent. And one of the things you want to do, and you, you can start doing this while I do it, is, um, and you're going to pick up a little bit of a flap there. Um, and then just start a little bit incision. You go, got to go through the body wall, and that's one way to do it. And then you can kind of lift. And sometimes now, if you use a larger scissors, that's why you have with these scissors. See, part of it is blunt. And that way, if you put that inside the fish, you're not going to nick any organs and get bleeding. So that's one option. We can we can put that underneath there, and then kind of lift, snip lift snip and begin to open that up oh I should have mentioned you see how I'm uh, laying them down the right side sorry I should have said this first I always do that and the reason do that is because the spleen is on the, the left side so you're gonna be able to visualize the spleen um, in fact on this one I'm already seeing the spleen showing up here but I just first want to show that incision and um, take your time and while you're doing it that way another another option you'll see some people doing is to to use a, uh, a scalpel and there in some cases You'll see um, what's done is to first make a incision here. You can put your forceps in here, and you, and you could then then you can open up your incision that way. You're lifting so you're not cutting, and you just continue on to the back of the sea loam, and you know you're there when you're, you're close to the vent. So that's one way. Or you may find it easier to, again, like with the other one, um, just use your scissors. In general, I go with scissors because there's less chance of nicking the liver or spleen. What I, what I like to do is then do a second in incision, which is kind of going to open up a window into the sea loam so you're kind of grabbing that and lifting you might in this case use different forceps you have in your kit uh, forceps that are called rat tooth they've got little teeth on it that's that can really help you so that the smooth uh, muscle and skin doesn't slip and that's when you use those going up toward the lateral line as much as I can and I'm gonna go all the way to the front and then I'm gonna open up a window here We can take that triangular flap off. Okay. We have we have two of our chart here. Um, first of all, let's start here. What what organ are we looking at? The liver. Okay. How about, how about this? Mm -hmm. 
This is the stomach here. Associated with the stomach is the pyloric ceca. And these are outpouchings that help in the digestion. They're also uh, a location that we look at sometimes because it's where the pancreatic tissue is associated with. And in Salmonids, you have one of the major diseases, in infectious pancreatic necrosis. So in some cases, we can see pathology associated with that. The other thing that is important about the pyloric ceca is, well, one is you're not going to see them in walleye or most any other species. You're going to see them in, this, in your Salmonids. But that's where we get a, a good assessment in terms of the amount of salomic fat, how much fat is covering. Sometimes you have so much fat internally that you can't even see those projections. These are not uncommonly confused for people who see it the first time as being worms. And um, that's not the case. Um, so really good. And here, here's, what do you, what's this white mass you think? Fat. Yeah, fat. So you're gonna see fat, as you probably know, instead of like a lot of our animals, which put down fat within the muscle, a uh, greater proportion is gonna be put down in the sea lobe. So this is gonna give us an idea of the plane of nutrition. Um, there's a scale for um, measuring the fat. And we tend to talk about whether there's zero fat, zero to 25% of the pyloric cecus cover, 25 or 50, and so on, um, up, up to 75 to 100%. Um, what are you seeing with your fish? Are you seeing that the pyloric cecus has some fat on it and there's some fat deposits? I'm seeing a lot of nodding of heads. And so what does that tell us about the, the group? It says that the group is, in general, getting um, a similar plane of nutrition. You can, you can pick out 20, or in some cases, 10 fish from a population of fish, and you'll have some fish that don't have any fat, and some that have a lot of fat. What does that tell you about how you're raising those fish? Too much competition. Too much competition. You have some fish that and one example of where you're going to see that is if you go to an automated system of automatic feeders and you have that feeder in a, one location, you're relying on more than 50% of your feeding associated with that. That feed comes down and basically you have a small, you can have a small percentage of the population that, that dominates that. The more they dominate, the bigger they get. The bigger they get, the more they dominate. And so you get under uh, nourishment of the others. To me, this is telling me something about the husbandry, that they were well fed and that the feed was being distributed uh, broadly to the group. And also that they were, um, and it supports what we saw with the apaxial muscles, um, that there's, you know, they're putting on muscle and also putting on fat. Now, um, Originally, when the index was developed by Ron Gady, um, it was designed for hatchery. Like, uh, he brought, was talking about in the DNR, you know, they, they want to see a lot of fat. Why? Because when you stock those fish, that's going to be the reserve until they figure out how they're going to find fish. So that was a goal for a lot of hatchery fish that, they would not stock fish out unless they were very high in fat. But on a commercial setting, you're not selling the fat. And so if you have excessive fat, that may be due to feeding too high of fat. But also, as we may have heard yesterday as well, with too high of uh, protein. So if you have fish on too high of a protein, that, then um, they may use as much as they can for, for uh, muscle tissue, but the excess is going to go down as fat, and that's not marketable. So you may be, that may give you an indication you want to look at a uh, percentage of fat that you're feeding to the fish. You can also see this in fish if they're not really active, it's active. Um, trout, you know, are, 
designed to swim against current, a certain amount of exercise, and some of that helps with development. When you don't have any current or any flow, um, you can, you can, they become in less active and they can uh, put that down. So there is a dark red, dark cherry red mass here. That's the spleen. Spleen is associated with the immunology of the fish. It gives you an idea. Um, it's filtering the blood, but it also has a lot of the um, uh, cells that are involved in developing an immune response. It can be a challenge to interpret, and you're going to see variations in size, and, um, and that can present a challenge. I want to come back to the liver. The liver is one of my favorite organs because that one really gives you an indication in terms of plant nutrition. If you're raising fish in a recirculating system, aquaponics or indoors, you will, there's a chance that you will see a higher uh, percentage of fish that are going to have pale livers. Pale livers might mean fatty livers. In some cases, the fat level is so high that um, you can clip a piece of the liver, which normally put in a glass of water will sink, and it will float. Um, but fatty liver tends to be a sign of nutritional imbalance, and a fatty liver in any animal, in us, dog or cat, is an animal that has a compromised immune system. And so they're gonna have more skin lesions, any kind of exposure to a bit of trauma, and some of the uh, bacteria that might be in the water are gonna be more of a problem to those fish. So liver, to me, these livers look really good, okay? They're nice, they're, 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 they're normal size, they're not enlarged, they're not pale, uh, to me, this tells me that these fish are, are getting the right nutritional requirements. And um, how about this here? It's going down to the vent. So that's the hind gut. We're going to come back to the hind gut, but I want to then point out you'll see the uh, uh, swim bladder, okay? On the lower side of the swim bladder, I'm seeing, for example, on this upper fit, something that's extending all the way from the top to the bottom. What do you think that is? And it, sh it will be paired. That's the gonads. So this one, I can tell, has small egg-like structures and so this is an immature female and when fish are younger sometimes it's hard to differentiate this fish band that is uniform width that is going the full length that's definitely going at when i look at it i don't see any small egg-like but it is so small that it's almost it's difficult to determine after you've examined the swim bladder, you can then grasp it with your forceps and pull it forward. And behind, you'll find what anglers call the blood vein, but as we learned this morning, is the kidney. It's a major organ for producing blood. If you nick it, it's, it's going to fill the cavity with blood. So this would be the, the, the caudal portion and the cranial portion, there's more of the blood producing or hematopoietic cells in the uh, caudal portions of it. And here's where, when inspection is done, this is a very important site along with the spleen for collecting samples to determine the presence of uh, bacteria or viruses. Now, why are, why are we focusing in on the kidney and spleen? Why are we focusing in on the internal organs? There should not be any. In a normal fish, there are no bacteria or no viruses. When disease occurs of a bacterial or viral nature, 
it may start from the outside of the fish, get into the bloodstream, the blood carries it to the kidney, and now you, that bacteria or the virus can propagate there, and that, that will cause the changes in the disease problems. For me, the kidney looks very nice. It's, it's um, very nice size, uniform in appearance. Some cases, what you'll see, you can see stones white stones, you can see nephrocalcinosis or calcium deposits. It's believed to be associated in some cases with elevated carbon dioxide. Um, and I'm gonna look at our second one here. And again, taking that swim bladder, pulling it up, and another very nice kidney, okay? Now, one of the things you can do is take your, um, take the intestines from the distal portion and cut it right at the vent. And now you can begin to pull that. I'm gonna pull it and you can, you can take it out. Now, one of the things you'll see, on this one it's quite red. And one of the things you can do is you can actually put your small scissors get the angle right, we'll cut that open, and grasp the end, put it right in there, nip, and that's going to open up and we can look at the content. Um, not uncommon in trout and salmon to find worms, some of them attach to the surface. You can see hemorrhage associated in some cases. It's a little bit, a little bit irritated, a little dark. You can see this also if you have um, response to uh, food that's causing irritation. In some cases, it can, it can be quite severe. This one is even more red. And if I take that out and maybe take it like that, this one looks quite red. One of the things I would say I've seen is quite a bit of variation, even within groups. So it's sometimes a little bit hard to make a diagnosis based on that. But we might scrape some of that material out. We can certainly look at it. A bit of digested food, a bit of mucus. We can look to see if there's parasites. This is a great site to collect samples to put on a slide and examine under a microscope. I'm going to um, take this out even further and here I might take my scissors and cut here we have our our liver and then other end here we have the intestines we have the pyloric cica oh yeah we've got a lot of fat covering it it's nice there's one other thing we missed, and here you'll see it. It's like a thin balloon. It should be associated with the liver. Gallbladder, correct. If the fish have been off feed, the, the gallbladder will be green. And uh, so that's an indication um, when, when we look at this, do a necropsy, see, you know, has this fish been eating? We can start at the beginning of the uh, where the esophagus enters into the stomach and we could open up and you'll see that tissue on the inside has these ridges that are contracting that are, are breaking down the food um, in the process. And so they'll, they'll, that'll travel then through the pyloric cica and then onwards. The other thing I want to show you is the heart. In some cases, we can get hearts that are small, large. Sometimes we'll see bumps or lesions on the heart. The brain, I'm going to, in fact, to be even safer, just grab the fish with the forceps, and we're gonna to try to cut the, the top off there of, of the head. And within there, should see, and here we have the brain. 
The brain is actually a really important organ for some of our uh, diagnostic tests. We, um, we're looking for any signs of, of hemorrhage. You know, there's some um, bacteria and viruses that like to focus in on brain tissue. Um, so take some time. Again, I'm seeing similar to what I saw in the other, in that the apexial muscles are <clears throat> nice and round, suggesting that they've been on a, a good plan of nutrition. I'm also seeing on this one, just like in last uh, this fish was probably laying down on its right side. The right eye is more flat. The left eye is more normal. Um, and then I can, um, you know, and looking even at the smaller specimen from the same group. Again, I'm seeing uh, really nice rounded apaxial muscles, good body condition <clears throat> there. The eyes, um, similar. One of the things we didn't really uh, talk about too much on the, uh, on the chart that sometimes we can see, and that is opacity of the cornea. Okay, I, I might think this is a bit cloudy. When you see eyes that are cloudy, you want to differentiate between, is it on the surface of the eye or is it in the lens? And we're going to do a technique of removing the eye on these fish after we've examined them that will allow you to distinguish between the two. But what could be another reason that we might be seeing what appears to be somewhat cloudiness on walleye? So the normal structure of the eye is to reflect light back. So that's reflecting back. Uh, you, you probably know if you, this time of the year, if you go along the rivers and lakes and you shine a light, you'll see eyes shining back like a cat at night. Why don't we take the eye out? <clears throat> and this will be a way to examine now, how are we going to do this? Perhaps I'm going to use, I'll use the other side. This side. So what you'll do is you'll take your forceps and you'll take your small scissors. And in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to put them in first closed and then we're going to open them. Put them in closed and open them. And that's going to provide blunt dissection. What that's going to do, it, it's not, it's going to push the tissue away, but it's not going to uh, rupture the, the, the globe. This is going to take a little while, but it's worth taking the effort. Now you might find it that you're trying to grab it and it's not um, allowing you to. You've got a nice selection of um, forceps. I might try Maybe these will work a little bit better. Or if not, I'm going to go to the rat tooth. But I think maybe these will go. And you're going to start pulling that tissue up. And just take your time. And it'll be attached in the back of the eye. I've got a little bit of you know, the edge. I think I can safely cut. And then it'll be attached by the optic nerve back here. That's what's holding it in. And now it'll come out. This also gives you, ex exposes the back of the eye. This should be um, nice and pink. No redness or hemorrhage or anything associated with it. So now I have the the eye out, and I can I can look at it more closely. I can look at the surface, and I can eat now at this point. Look at the back. I don't see any uh, hemorrhage. I see where the optic nerve here 
was connected and here where it goes to the brain. Um, and then I may set the eye down and open it up, see what sort of fluid. This is one way to differentiate too. For example, if we have, you're gonna, should have a clear fluid coming out. And then from this also should come out a lens. And the lens is gonna be a capsule that should be discrete and intact. It's very, you, you can see what remains of it here. It's very clear. So any cloudiness really is more associated with the normal structure of this fish. Sometimes it's important to be able to take out the eye again. If you have fish with exophthalmia or Popeye, it could be that they're swelling behind the eye that's pushing the eye out. And, and by using this technique, you can, you can differentiate. So I'm gonna say the eyes are normal. Now I'm gonna look at the, the fins on these fish. And I'm gonna start with the, um, the, the pectoral, the pelvic, and they do not show any signs of any abnormalities in terms of erosion. A slight little dip on this one, but beautiful um, fins, both sides of the body and the tail fin is excellent condition. Same thing on the smaller fish, because you know, Good to look at smaller fish and larger fish because sometimes we're gonna be seeing um, different things in different sized fish. And as far as the skin, I'm not seeing any skin lesions on, on these, um, any, any redness, a, a scale loss, any of those sorts of things. One of the things we didn't, we looked at a bit in the other one, and we shouldn't, this one is, is examining the mouth and uh, there we can, we can grab a hold of the, Open that up. Sometimes we'll see abnormalities, not uncommon in seeing walleyes in the wild with um, leeches attached to the inside of the mouth, um, but very normal looking mouth on, on this specimen. And I would say on the smaller one, I do see a, a little bit of erosion. On, on the tip, that may be from um, trauma against the side of the tank. Mm, very minor, not, it's not, not anything that's gonna impair its ability to obtain food and grow. Mouth looks normal. I'm gonna lay them down. Next, I will grab a hold of the perculum and it up and clip it off. All right, now I've exposed the gill of mine. Smaller one has slightly um, paler gills, but it's uniform. And I'm not seeing any dark spots or light spots or raised lesions or nodules. Um, these gills look uh, good in terms of their, their conformation or shape. The color is lighter on um, both of these, but I think it's probably more of a function in terms of post-mortem changes. Um, but so now I'm going to proceed over to opening up the Salome cavity. You know, you're gonna see the variation in different species. Trout tend to be, and walleye tend to be relatively easy to do necropsies on. With this one, I was able to open up and expose all the way to the heart. I like to start out with the, the, the liver, and the liver here is uniform in appearance, slightly pale. I don't see any, you know, one of the terms we use with livers is modeling. 
and certainly in comparison to the char, this is a more pale um, liver, but still within, within normal. The other thing, you may run into some livers that easily, if you put an instrument on it, break apart. That's got an interesting term called friable. It's a friable liver, but um, I don't know why they came up with it, because I, I don't think it has to do with frying. <laughs> because normally the liver is, it, it's, very, it's very dense and intact. But if it's, it seems like it's easily breaking apart, that term friable is used in, in pathology. A lot of fat, um, uh, intersalomic fat covering the internal organs. In fact, in order to take a look, I'll need to remove some of that. I nicked a bit of the um, lower digestive tract. It appears to have content of a green, greenish tint to the feed. And this fish was clearly eating. You can see the different segments of feed in there. Uh, before I remove that, we will locate the spleen. In this case, it's a little bit, it's more buried. Kind of move that fat out of the way. And it's hiding underneath here. And this is gonna be the spleen on, on this fish. A lot of fat around the intestines, over the spleen. Looking um, then toward the uh, swim bladder, see, um, don't see any real abnormalities. These holes here were um, what I produced. I'm looking for the gonads, and there's, there's really not much at this point. They're pretty immature, but we want to look more cranially because. That's where the ovaries are gonna first develop, if there are any. And uh, so I'm not seeing any, definitely not any mature. We talked about looking at the muscle with perch. And one of the conditions seen in the wild is heterosporosis, which is a condition that's seen in the muscle. So we can do an examination, visual exam, because the parasite will cause lesions that look as if the, the fish has almost been cooked. And here when we look at the muscle, we see normal muscle tissue, which is even in appearance, translucent, and it looks really good. If you're starting to get fillets that are showing um, hemorrhage in the muscles, sometimes that can be associated with how they're being moved, sometimes with um, a mechanical um, tr transport devices, pumps. Um, the other thing this does is, if you have fish that have a curved spine, um, this is the first step, and uh, with that you can go the next step, which is you can remove that, that muscle, and I'm just gonna remove this flap here of muscle. Okay. And then we can start taking that muscle away in order to look at the spine. Now in some cases if these are pond reared fish you can have crooked spines due to things like uh, lightning strike to the pond, electric straight voltage electrocution. You can have development of curvature of the spine in young fish due to vitamin C deficiency. You see as I'm doing this, now we can um, quite readily see a side view. Okay, so I've scraped away this muscle and we'll, from this we see the vertebral column. Some cases you'll get trout where whoop, all, it's, all of a sudden this is raised up and curves down and that can do to the rapid muscle contraction due to electrocution or, or um, lightning strike and the muscle uh, spasms so quickly that they dislocate the spine. Um, the spine on this walleye is normal. Great. 
and uh, yeah. in older fish or if we had brood stock we might see some um, deposits or of calcium that are leading to uh, crooked spine but in, that's one easy way to take a look at the spine short of taking a radiograph or x-ray.